morning. Hey, it is good to see you all here. Um, thanks for joining us this morning. We're glad you're here. Welcome. Um, if you're new or if you're visiting, my name is Doug Betts. I am the children and youth pastor um, here, and I just want to want to thank you for being here this morning. Welcome you uh, here. Uh, and these guys are awesome. Um, I'm kind of a little bit bummed that I'm going to be in kids' church, so I'm going to miss uh, some of this a little bit later, but that's okay, too. Uh, I, I want to thank you um, for your encouragement, for your prayers, for your support uh, of the praise band. And there's, there's some of them that, that aren't here. Um, but just really, I, I appreciate so much all of the support and everything that you guys have, have uh, poured into them. If you would, just be praying for us, um, especially my wife and I. Uh, as we go, um, we're leaving Thursday to go to Branson um, on a conference, so us, us two and 15 students, so um, just be praying for that. But again, I just I so thank your support and encouragement so much. Um, a few other announcements, just to make a reminder that uh, tomorrow night is our Christmas Eve service. It will be at 5 o'clock tomorrow, candlelight service. And then a week from today, our December 30th service, will have one service, and that will be at 9 a.m., um, on December 30th. So, and then I would like to uh, just share with you that we are we're starting back up divorce care and divorce care for kids. And, and I've seen, um, you know, we shared that on, on Facebook, on our, our Facebook page, and I've seen different posts and different things. And I know that um, often divorce affects a lot of us. Um, I, I was a kid of a divorce, and so I, you know, have gone through some of that. Um, but I know that it, it does have an effect on us in, in many ways. And I think some of us sometimes just like move on and we think that we're good but I've seen and heard a lot of different stories about you know how there are just things that that we sometimes haven't moved on from or haven't figured out and just help in dealing with that and surrounding yourselves with, with people that have gone through the same situations I think is encouraging and so as, I, as I've read and heard stories I would just encourage you if you've been through a divorce um, if maybe you're, you're in that right now um, to to at least ask about divorce care and divorce care for kids to see if that's something that might um, be a benefit to you because I think from everything I've heard um, from the people that have been through just a tremendous help and support for them so I'd encourage you um, in that and, and you can find more information on that in, in your bulletin here um, and then as we move into worship I, I just want to I don't know the story behind the, the little drummer boy but I know I feel like um, I can probably relate to him I think his story is similar to me in that uh Oftentimes, when I stand before God and, and um, I want to do great things and I want to give him great things and like I, I really don't have any great gifts to give. But I think deep down we all have the gifts that he's given us in our um, abilities and gifts. And if we just use those to the best of our ability, that's a great gift to him. So if you would stand and join us uh, as we continue to worship. Thank you. We also want to thank Doug Johnson for everything that he does. He runs our sound and all the lights and the... He spends many hours with us um, practicing, so thank you for all that you do.
busy and crazy busyness of everything that's going on, and you would just focus on you and your amazing gifts like that. Thank you, God, for all of our blessings. <laughs> Please be seated. At this time, we're going to uh, release any young people that would like to go to children's <coughs> church, grades kindergarten through fourth grade, to have a special program just for you upstairs. If you want to make your way there, it's a fun opportunity. <coughs> As we progress in the Advent season, today is the last Sunday before Christmas Day. Our anticipation is growing for the celebration of the birth of Jesus. And for our prayer time today, I want to consider a passage in Isaiah in the Old Testament where the prophecies are identified about the coming Messiah. I invite you to listen as I read Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, which says, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and a government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty well accomplish this. What can we learn from these words from Isaiah chapter 9? In this passage, Isaiah foretells the character and names associated with Jesus the Messiah who would be born as a, uh, a son of God. And uh, the four main names that are listed here, first of all, wonderful counselor, that is that he is an amazing resource and guide. Secondly, mighty God. He is powerful and divine. Third, everlasting father. That focuses on his eternity and that he is the father in the Trinity. Everlasting or prince of peace. His life will bring peace on earth as we celebrate these fulfilled promises for the Messiah. At Christmas, we pray that these spiritual truths would inspire our prayers as a church family as we pray together. We already have prayer joints and concerns that were shared in our earlier worship service, and we have prayer cards that have been turned in with some items that we'll include during our prayer time. We have some items that have been passed on verbally to the pastoral staff to include during our prayer time. Uh, but we want to uh, be aware of and sensitive and receive whatever items that you would share, not only joys and concerns, but especially testimonies about what God is doing in and through your life and the lives of other people. Yes, back there. That's great. Good reminder and uh, very timely as this is a season of lots of activity and interaction. You bet. Thank you for sharing that. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies? Yes. It's a very difficult situation. We'll pray for that, and uh, our heart goes out to that family as a difficult uh, situation to process. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies? Back there, yes. Okay, thank you, Jill. Good to see your mom here today, too. We'll pray for your family. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies. We welcome the things that are on your heart. Whatever's on your heart, we want. Yes. pray for that. That's a good reminder. You bet. 
other joys, concerns, and testimonies, uh, whatever's on your heart, we want to share together as a church family as we pray together. I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a minute with a pattern of prayer following the letters of the word ACTS, A-C-T-S, as an outline in which A represents adoration or praise, C represents confession, T represents thanks, and S represents supplication or praying for others. I want to encourage you to be praying on your own. I'll offer some suggestions as we're praying, but uh, please pray in your own heart however God prompts you. Join me in your hearts as we pray together. As we begin in our prayer time with a time to focus on adoration or praise to God, I invite you to talk to God in your own heart, praising him however he prompts you. We worship you, Lord. We acknowledge that you alone are the master, the king, the, the Lord, the ruler almighty. You are sovereign. We praise you for the prophecy from Isaiah that said, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. No wonder we praise you. No wonder we worship you. Praise God. Praise God. move on in our prayers to focus on a time for the topic of confession. I invite you to talk to God in your own heart about your own life, however he prompts you. God, we come seeking your cleansing and healing. Isaiah 9 reminds us that the Messiah will be the Prince of Peace, and if we could save ourselves, there would be no need for Jesus to come. We need the peace and forgiveness that only he can offer. We can't do anything in our own power to take away our sin or to save ourselves. We realize we don't deserve God's forgiveness. We can't earn it. We can't pay it back. It's only by grace. Therefore, I confess my sin and I repent and I humbly ask for your forgiveness, healing, and cleansing. move on in our prayers to the time to focus on giving thanks. I invite you to talk to God in your own heart, thanking him for whatever he prompts you to thank him for. We praise you, God, for this church family and the opportunity to share together on our spiritual journey. Thank you for each one in this church family. We give you thanks along with Jeanette Luke that the uh, activity at the uh, Hope Ranch is taking place and they have some victims of difficult situations or starting in a recovery process, we pray that you continue to be with them. We thank you along with Renee Scoggin that uh, her son Micah has received an excellent job and has actually started at Goddard, Kansas as a city planner. And we pray, uh, giving you praise for the healing you've brought in Micah's life with uh, health concerns in the last few years and that uh, he and his wife are expecting another child. We pray for all the details related to their relocation and new opportunities give you thanks for this Advent season as we prepare our hearts for Christmas and we give you praise as we anticipate the special Christmas Eve service tomorrow evening. We pray that you would be even now preparing our hearts for that time of worship. We give you praise for your work in and through uh, Hope who have recently joined the church family in December, Phyllis Shelberg and Jeff Slate, and we pray that you continue to encourage them on their spiritual journey. on in our prayers to a time to focus on supplication or praying for others. I invite you to talk to God in your own heart and praying for others however he prompts you. God, there's lots of needs and we know that you alone are the source of help, hope, and healing. So we pray for your touch for many who need that. We pray along with Teresa for 
prayers for the military, for decisions being made, for timely manner that uh, things are processed. Lord, uh, be with all concerned in that regard. We pray along with Jill and her family. Be with them to support and encourage them with all that they need. We pray along with Kenny for the uh, uh, family that uh, has a terminal cancer diagnosis. It's very difficult, and we pray for your strength, for your help, for your courage for that family. We pray along with uh, Diane Coleman for traveling mercies and safety and good interaction for families who will be gathering to share holidays together. Be with all that are gathered. We pray with Chris Jones for his brother Curtis, who's in a Lincoln, Nebraska hospital in a semi-sedated state after complications following surgery. We pray for him to heal and recover and be able to to get past this difficult time. We commit him to your care and provision. We pray along with George Stroop for a grandson who had surgery recently and is recovering. Continue to protect him, keep him, we pray. We pray along with Kristen Lawrence for granddaughter Madeline who has an eye concern and abscess that needs drops and it's very uh, difficult for this uh, young gal. <coughs> Helper and healer, we pray. <coughs> we pray along with Drew Graybaum for his uh, uh, family, and specifically his dad who has uh, uh, Parkinson's, who, which is causing increasing limitations and challenges, and we pray for his mom as she seeks to care for him. Help them, we pray. We pray along with Tammy Eck for Mitch and concerns for him. We just commit him to your care and for all that he needs. We pray for Dan Reeling as he recovers at home now after being released from the hospital. He's still battling the infection in his leg and hip. We pray for your touch for all that he needs. We pray for Harold Seeley as he continues in Mitchell County Hospital. Help him with all that is concerning for him. We pray along with uh, Beverly Roman and Leela File as it's been a difficult season for them with adjustments and challenging family situations. Help them, we pray. Pray for Roger Thielander as he heals and recovers at home. We pray for the Fusion Praise Team and Doug and Dina Betts as they'll be going to a special uh, training conference in Branson next week. Give them safety, give them inspiration, give them encouragement. We pray for Adrian Meyer as he continues to heal and recover following hip replacement surgery. Protect him and help him, we pray. We want to remember the families of those who have experienced passing of loved ones, and we pray for the family of Doug Betts and Lois Wallace as her funeral will be tomorrow at the Roberts Family Funeral Home. Send comfort and peace to her family, and also for the family of Jackie Fobes as she passed away Saturday, December 22nd at Wichita Hospital. We pray as the family uh, makes plans to remember her life, that you would be with them and send comfort and peace to them. And be with us as your church family to... Be sensitive to your prompting to reach out and support and encouragement and love to be the hands and feet and uh, the help that uh, lets people know they're not alone during these difficult times. We pray for Pastor Cliff as he preaches today. Fill him, anoint him, use him. Allow your spirit to be present to prompt the heart of each one who hears that we may each sense how you're prompting us to practically apply your truth to each of us on our spiritual journey. We all are at different places, but we all have a next step, and we pray for your help to guide us in that next step, whatever it may be. Holy Trinity, we worship you and yield to you now. God with us, Emmanuel, Savior, come to us and bring us your peace. Help us find our joy and our purpose. Restore us and bring us your peace. May the dreams that we have and our visions give us hope and bring us your peace. Holy child, come among us and claim us, make us family and give us your peace. Stir up your love and give us your peace. God with us, Emmanuel, Savior, be born in us and give us your peace. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen.
morning. Well, as was mentioned earlier, this is a very busy time, isn't it? Man, we're all going. We're all kind of excited. The festivities and all that stuff is happening. We're going to meet together as families, and we're going to exchange some gifts. Hopefully, you'll get some, maybe even more than you give. Who knows? It's a fun time, right? And yet, sometimes a lot of people miss the whole reason that we're doing this. It's not just a time that we go through busyness just to have festivities. It's a time to have a birthday party, right? Birthday party for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, he had to, he had to be born, so that's what we're celebrating. But this time, we're going to talk about why he was born, right? He was born to save us. It's an amazing, amazing gift. So we come to, t uh, to this time of communion, and uh, you know, it's easy to get, like I say, get caught up in stuff and even the visions and the scenery in our minds of what this holiday season is. And one of those that we see a lot is the nativity scene. And I think my study Bible has got a neat little, I'm going to share this with you. It says, although our first picture of Jesus is as a baby in a manger, it must not be our last. The Christ child in the manger has been made into beautiful Christmas scenery. We cannot leave him there. This tiny, helpless baby lived an amazing life, yet he died for us. He ascended to heaven, and he will come back to this earth as the king of kings. Christ will rule the world, and he will judge all people according to their decisions about him. So do you still picture Jesus as a baby in the manger, or is he your Lord? And that's what we're going to celebrate, isn't it? That he is our Lord. We praise him for that. The uh, deacons are going to pass out the elements that we're going to use to uh, in our communion time. We're going to have a, this meal together. A lot of you are visiting. That's great. We welcome you, and we're glad that you're here. And we welcome you to join in with us as we share this time of remembrance. All we ask is that you've given your life to Jesus, that he is your Lord. And so hold all the elements until we all can, can take them all together as, as a family. So let us pray. Father God, we do praise you and we thank you for the gift first of your son that you'd share with us and then the greatest gift, that being eternal salvation, living with you. God, what a wonderful thing. I pray, Lord, that you would bless this time together and that you'd minister, minister to us through the song that the youth praise team will lead us to. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Yes, it is a hallelujah, isn't it? You know, just a few days uh, before Jesus gave us that gift of eternal life, he was with his disciples, and it's written in Luke, it says in the 22nd chapter, and he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Yes, it was an awesome gift. Speaking of gifts, we have a chance to give back to God that, is that with which he's already entrusted us. Because remember, everything that we have, everything in this world is all his. He doesn't need us, but he wants to give us that opportunity we can show our adoration and love back to him. So God made us managers of that stuff that he gave us, the stuff, the things, the money, but the talent and the time. He gave it all to us, and now we have a chance to give back to him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity that you've entrusted with us to share with you and to share your word with others, that we might be your voice here on earth. God, help us to to listen to you, to be obedient to your calling, that we might be called good managers. We love you, God. I ask that you bless the gifts and the givers. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hey, good morning, church. I could sense that you really wanted to give a good clap there, but hadn't figured out with communion how to do that. Um, if you want to thank the youth praise team now, that would be great. We, we really are blessed. We see Jesus in you guys. We just want you to know. So thank you for leading us in worship today. Uh, we are glad that you're here, uh, that you have taken the time and an effort uh, to be among us as we worship today. We hope that you can make it tomorrow night, 5 o'clock, uh, for our celebration of what God has done in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Um, and then just a reminder that a week from today, there's only one service at 9 o'clock, so we change our schedules just for that one Sunday uh, between Christmas and New Year's. So a couple of reminders, but, but glad you're here now because um, we believe God wants to speak to us now, and we're going to look to his word. So if you have a Bible... Luke chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 20, and there's a danger here because uh, you've all heard these verses a lot. Um, it's uh, the kind of the classic Christmas passage of Luke 2, um, talks about the birth of Christ. So the danger is that our minds and our hearts can kind of zone out because we're like, yeah, I heard that, I've seen that, you know, in your mind. But if we, if we really pray and ask God to, uh, to speak to us, I think what you find is this beautiful thing about God's word is that it's, it's a fresh word. It's a new word. You can read this text, and for some of you, if you're traveling, this is like the only text you ever hear us preach, it seems, because you show up on Christmas time and we preach these. You could read this text every day, and God would speak a new word to you if we listen. And so that's what we pray now. So let me read this first, Luke 2, 1 through 20. Follow along in your Bible or on the screen. This is God's word. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Let's take a moment to pray. We are grateful, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is present among us. We pray that you would supernaturally open our hearts and our minds, our lives, so that we, in hearing you speak, God, would be changed by this. Uh, we would live differently. We would live with a renewed love and hope and joy and peace for your glory. 
So God, would you do this work in us? We're here in your name. We've gathered in your name, um, and we pray this in your name. Amen. A, A long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, Um, I was a youth pastor at another church, and and I was in charge, I was placed in charge of the annual Christmas pageant for the children. Now, Steve and Kim Ladd do such a great job. We just had ours here a couple weeks ago, and they do such a fantastic job um, with our students in presenting the truth of the incarnation. Um, I didn't do such a great job with it. It wasn't really my giftedness, but they told me, hey, you gotta, you gotta organize this thing. And I, f- I found out one lesson really quickly, and that is, I didn't know this before, but there is a pecking order for roles in the Christmas pageant. Like, there are some roles that people really want, and there are some that are less prized. Um, the, the least prized role in all of the people who are involved in the incarnation is, is Joseph. Like, like, nobody wants to be Joseph. One, he has no lines, so you get nothing. And every time somebody else shows up at the manger, guess who has to move to the back out of the way? It's Joseph, right? He's, like, not necessary almost. So nobody really wants to be Joseph, and especially at the church I was serving because we, we had a little confrontation. Um, we were doing it with kindergartners. There was a kindergartner who was Mary. And there was a kindergartner who was Joseph. And um, we had told her to bring a little baby doll for baby Jesus, some doll that she'd be familiar with and comfortable with, and she brought it, and we're trying to run through a practice and all of this stuff, and I could see this little war starting to happen because Joseph wanted to keep picking up baby Jesus. And, uh, and this didn't go over well with Mary, and so poor baby Jesus was getting into a tug of war uh, between the two, and finally the little girl just snatched baby Jesus right out of his hands, ripped him away, and she said, he's not your baby. (laughs) And I'm standing there with the teacher as we're watching this unfold. I should have intervened, but I just leaned over to the teacher and I said, well, you know, theologically, she's correct. You know, I mean, she's got something going there. So nobody wanted to be Joseph. It wasn't even safe to be Joseph in our play. So then we had Mary. There's only one to do that. A few people maybe wanted to be the three wise men because they had some cool props, you know, that they could bring in. Um, But there was, I was unexpected this. Everybody, almost everybody wanted to be a shepherd. There was two reasons for that. One, they always had, we had robes, of course, that they wore, but they always had those head things, and they always have kind of a, well, we used headbands, so half of our play had Michael Jordan headbands uh, on their heads like this. And so they thought that was cool. But I think what they really liked was the props that go with the shepherd, which was what? The shepherd's staff, the crook, right? A little you know, staff that comes up like that. And everybody got a shepherd's staff, which was a really bad idea. Don't ever do that if you're leading, because you, you can do a lot of damage with a shepherd's staff. And everybody wanted one, and you can, you can even bring down the Star of Bethlehem, I don't know if you knew that, with a shepherd's staff. So everybody wanted to be a shepherd. We had about 150 shepherds in our play, and it was fantastic. But I thought, wow, it's great to be a shepherd. That's actually completely opposite of the truth. The truth is, we're reading this text about how God meets us where we're at. And today we're looking at shepherds. God meets shepherds where they're at. And in that day, in the first century, nobody wanted to be a shepherd. Nobody, upon graduating from school, said, boy, I just can't wait to get into my chosen career of being a shepherd. Nobody, mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be shepherds, was a popular song at the time. Nobody wanted to be a shepherd. Why? Because everyone saw shepherding as the last resort. It's the job you take when you've tried to get the jobs you really want and can't. It's a horrible job, and the people who are shepherds were considered unreliable. Um, They were not truthful. They were considered to be liars and cheats. If you were missing something, the first person they would ask would be a shepherd, probably took it. And so a shepherd was viewed very low in the social spectrum of things, including um, kind of uh, things that took away some of their civil rights because most people didn't trust shepherds. They were not allowed, rabbis said, they were not allowed to hold judicial positions. If there was something that was happening in a court of law, a shepherd's testimony was not admissible because they were considered to be suspect in terms of the truth. There was all kinds of things that shepherds really endured in terms of 
how they stood in their culture were not viewed very highly at all. Even Jesus, by the way, gives a nod to this. When, do you remember when Jesus in John chapter 10 is talking about the good shepherd? He, he calls himself the good shepherd. He says a good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. The sheep know, uh, he knows the sheep by name. He said, that's all the good shepherd. But he also says in John chapter 10, he said, and you guys all know by contrasting this, what it's like when you have hired shepherds, hired hands. He said, when a wolf comes and a shepherd's job is to protect the sheep, the hired shepherd runs for his life and takes off and leaves the sheep. And when Jesus is saying this in this context, people would be nodding, going, oh yeah, we, we know about shepherds. We know that's exactly how they would react. So even in, in the time period, people would see shepherds in a very kind of downgraded way, and their job itself contributed to this because it isolated them. A, a shepherd's job was to be, as we read, out in the fields, living in the fields, because you have to stay with your sheep, and that means you have to protect against predators, but you also have to watch in case the sheep starts to wander off by itself. You have to lead them to pastures where they can eat, and sometimes, depending on the time of year, Shepherds, sort of like some of you truck drivers, they, they would be gone for eight months at a time taking their sheep to various pastures before they could make it back home. And all that contributes to this. The job itself is isolated from other people, gone for long periods of time. They feel out of the loop. They feel truly, we use the phrase, but they really felt this as outsiders. They don't know what people are talking about. They don't know what's really happening in people's lives because they're so, by their job, disconnected. So here is a group of shepherds that everybody considers outsiders, and it then really starts to pile up in our minds. This, this really means something, that God could choose all, any kinds of people to bring this wonderful news. Hey, the kingdom of God is coming because God has broken into our world as a human being. Who is he going to tell this to? And he chooses outsiders. He chooses the last people that other people would have thought would have been a good choice for passing along really, really important news. But God chooses these outsiders. Doesn't that already begin to tell you and me something about this love of God that we always underestimate? We always underestimate the love. Oh, I know God loves you. I know God loves you. We underestimate just how deep and wide and high and profound the love of God is where he says, I know you. He could say to each one of these shepherds, I have seen you out in the fields by yourself where you think no one knows you. You think you could drop over dead today and no one would even notice. But God says, I see you. I know you by name. I've come to you. Those that think they des least deserve it, I've come to you. This tells us this love of God is deep, but then it also tells us their response is important here. If you're always on the outside and you finally get included, wouldn't you think that'd be this great moment of joy? Fantastic. We got chosen. It's like winning the lottery. We're, we're in. God's come to us. But their first reaction is not that. At the end it is. But their first reaction is absolute terror. In fact, the text is, is not, it's, it's hard to grab it. In the original, as it's translated in English, it comes out, you know, they're terrified. But what it literally says is they feared a great fear. This is more than, than just being startled, like you're out in the dark at night and suddenly, boom, lights come on, the glory of God, there's angels. I'm just startled. It's deeper than that. It's way deeper than that. They feared a great fear, and it wasn't primarily the light it was, the light was, a reflect, uh, was uh, pointing to this, it was the glory of God. The glory of God shone around them. What is the glory of God, and why would it cause shepherds and us to be afraid, to fear a great fear? Well, the glory of God is basically this. The glory of God is the weight of who God really is in his fullness, the glory of God is to say that God is so amazingly great in, in his power, in his knowledge, in his wisdom, in his love. And the full weight of that begins to happen when you are experiencing the glory of God. You're, you're feeling the weight of God's truth, of who he is. And you know how this works. Say if you're, if you're 
decent at something in your life. I don't know, maybe it's knitting or playing a sport or, or doing some skill, working with something, and you're pretty good at it. Have you ever been in a situation where you're doing your thing, but somebody comes in who you know, they know it too, they are like way better than you, like they are the expert of the expert. Makes you a little intimidated to be trying to do your thing while someone else who's greater than you comes in. I mean, it'd be like me playing down basketball down at the municipal building. LeBron James comes walking into the gym or something, right? I think I'm pretty good. LeBron, set the pick, man. Throw me the pass, you know. Am I going to be taught? I'm going to be like, whoa. I mean, anything LeBron wants to do. Why? Because there's a certain, there's a certain weight to his presence because why? Well, he's so far superior in his abilities. Now take that. That's just one little example, but take that with God. Imagine we're always kind of trying to reach God, seek God, feel God, experience God, but when the glory of God is happening around us, it means all of those things that diminish it or take it away is gone, and suddenly you are standing in the glory of God, and the fear that rises is that you and I feel exposed. Wow. He is so far greater than I thought, but that means his holiness compared to my unrighteousness. That means his love compared to my unloving heart and spirit. That means all of those things about God which are so different than me, and I feel completely exposed because now the difference, I hide it from you guys really well, by the way. I, I spend much, much of my life trying to make sure, well, you guys only will see the best parts, but in the glory of God, guess what? It all gets revealed. And you can see then, it doesn't matter if you're an outsider or insider, if you're in the glory of God, you fear a great fear. And here's the fear. This God has now exposed me for who I really am. I'm done for. I'm done for. I can't stand in the presence of a holy God. I've tried to fool myself and fool others a whole long time, but right now it's all crystal clear in the glory of God. I cannot stand before this God. And if God chooses right now, every justification is there to completely wipe me out as a sinner. And the great fear is that I've been exposed for who I really am and it's not good. Here's the beautiful thing, of course, with God. God reveals this fear, and he's going to say briefly, we'll get to it, don't fear, don't be afraid. But the fear comes first, and God purposefully does this. He does this because he wants to reveal the real issue of our lives is not, if you're a shepherd, that you have lied occasionally. That's not the primary issue. The real issue in the, in the light of the glory of God is not that you have stolen a sheep here or there. It's not that you haven't done your duty properly. It's not the particular sins of our lives. So if you come this morning, you're like, I, I think God just wants me to kind of fix this sin, and I think God just wants me to kind of fix this sin. You're missing what the glory of God does in causing us to fear a great fear, which is the root. What's at the very root of my heart that makes me do these things that I regret and I, I have a great fear that they'll be exposed. What's at the root of it? And, and I think one way that theologians have tried to put it is there's, there's one root sin. And it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, this one root sin is common to every one of us because we're all sinners, and that is pride. Most people think pride, well, that's like if you feel real arrogant, you know, where, where you tell LeBron to get off the court because you think you're better than LeBron, that kind of thing. No, it's not really just arrogance. Pride, in a theological sense, the root of all sins is that pride says something that's not true, but we believe it. And that is, I belong to myself. That's at the very core of pride, that I am an independent, self-sufficient person. I make my own life. I, am my, I belong to no one. Pride is that root sin that says, even though I am created, I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to overcome it and say, no, I'm really my own person and I don't belong to anybody. That's an inversion of reality. And, and we have two great evidences, by the way, of this reality that we deny by our pride, by human pride. The two evidences are the beginning and the end. The beginning of your life is a great evidence that you and I are not our own. Why? Because think about when you're born. You have absolutely zero input into where you're born. 
You have zero input to whom you are born. You have zero input as to when you are born. You have zero input into the genetic makeup, whether you're going to have blue eyes or brown eyes or whatever. You have zero input in how you come into this life. This nothing. You control nothing. You just show up. And even when you show up, all you can do is poop a lot. That's about all you can do. That's all you got going for you, right? You are completely dependent on everybody else in your life to take care of you, to feed you, to protect you. But somewhere along the line, I think age two, you start to say, mine. No, and you draw lines, and you start basically marking out your space, and you go on a long drive, and some of you took a long drive to get here. We, we actually have one of our daughters driving with a, 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 he'll be six months old coming up here, and he's already, I think, starting to recognize, I have a kingdom. It's my sphere of influence of what I get to say. And so later on, he's going to draw a line in the car and say to his brother or sister, you cannot cross this line. This line is not to be crossed under any means. Why? Because this is my kingdom over here, and you can't have any part of it. It starts early, and somewhere in then between, but the first evidence is how we're born. The last evidence is how we die. Because we have absolutely no say, almost virtually no say in when the last heartbeat happens. And when the last breath happens, none. But in between, we say, I'm a self-made person. I'm complete. This is my life. And this lie that we believe, theologically, we call pride because it sets up our kingdom and it says, this is my life. And okay, if I believe in God, I'll give God a few things. I've got a kingdom. I'll give him a few extra things here. I'll give him some time, some, some money here. I'll go to church. I'll read my Bible occasionally. But make no mistake about it. This is my life. And that happens to shepherds and to kings and everybody in between. We all have our pride that says, God, I know you created me. I know if you stopped thinking about me right now, I would cease to exist. And God, I've, I've fashioned my whole life around making it my own, doing my own thing. And by the way, if you're like, shepherds, can they really be prideful? Because everybody's always talking them down. Yeah, when pride is seen as a kingdom making thing. Can you think of what happens if you're always out on your own and you're always, uh, you have to rely on yourself. Nobody's going to come to your aid. You get to be pretty self-reliant. I'll bet you if you gave these shepherds some duct tape and some bailing twine, wire or whatever, these guys would have it made. They're like, I can make anything. I can do anything. I can make it. I, I mean, I know that's not anything like our Midwestern here where you guys are just, you know, you, you guys make everything happen by yourself because you have to. There's nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing. At some point, that transfers over into all other areas of life where I say, I get to choose. Now, the fact that God allows us to do that and to live that way shows how great his grace is. I don't deserve it. But the glory of God reveals it. Oh, I owe everything to you. My life is not my own. My life is yours, God. That's what the shepherds are feeling. And this fear that begins to rise in their life, right away the words that the angels give them are trying to help them to see. Yeah, don't you see? You were not made to live as if you were self-reliant because you can't live that way. But here's the good news, fellas. A Savior has been born to you. The, the news that he gives to the shepherds is that you need a savior. I can guarantee you pride will resist that. Pride will say, I don't need a savior. I might need some help occasionally. God, if you could help me out in some tough fixes here and there, but I don't need a savior, do I? No, a savior has been born to you. You need a savior. So pride, you can tell right away, will resist this. It's like this will probably happen in the next couple days for some of you. And you'll, you'll give a good smile, so it'll be okay. Nobody will know, but I'll know. But here's the way it goes. You'll get a gift, and you'll, you won't be, you'll be less than thrilled with the gift. You'll be like, thank you. I really appreciate this. But in the back of your mind, you're going, I think I'm re-gifting this one to Pastor Cliff, right? Pastor Cliff will get this. I, I'm going to give this. I don't really need this. So, like, if you gave me a gift, just draw one out of here. If you gave me a gift, I opened the, the gift, and it's a box of Rogaine. A box of Rogaine. I'd be like, hey, thank you very much. But in my mind, I'd be like, I have such a thick 
luscious, full head of hair. Why would I need a box of Rogaine? I'm looking at pictures the other day, and I'm trying to figure out who is this balding guy that's holding my grandson, and I turn around, and I look, oh my goodness, it's right back here. There's something going on. It's like the lunar land rover or something that happened back. I'm like, do I really need this? That's the big question. That is the huge question. We talk about this, and we, we sing about this. This is what the gospel begins with. Your pride is going to resist knowing that you need a Savior. You have to be rescued. If you can hear that, if you can receive that, oh, then you're going to start to see something more than just fear in the presence of God. You're going to see love and joy and peace. He also says you're, he is the Messiah, this, this promised one. He's the Messiah, the Lord. And that's a really... That's a very controversial thing to say in the first century. And the reason is, we heard about Caesar Augustus. He calls the census. He's the Roman emperor. Did you know that in the first century, once Caesar Augustus had gotten control, and he'd gotten control by a bloody civil war, and he, he won out. He's the adoptive son of Julius Caesar. But Caesar Augustus reigns for a long time. He, he consolidates power. This guy has power over the largest empire in the world, the, the best army all at his command. And it starts to go to his head a little bit because Augustus has coins minted that say Caesar Augustus is the savior of the world. No kidding. That phrase, Caesar is the savior of the world. So now you have somebody coming along saying, the savior of the world has been born. Everybody's like, no, that's already taken. Caesar's got that. No, the true savior has come. Caesar Augustus also, he declared that his father, Julius Caesar, was a god, and therefore he took the title. No kidding. Caesar Augustus said he is a son of God. And so when you see the gospel beginning to say, no, no, there's a, there's a pretender kingdom here, and that's Caesar. And you're like, yeah, it's a pretty good pretense because he's got control of everything. He's got all con amazing power over us, and somebody said, no, but the true Savior, the true Son of God has been born. And basically what this is saying is when Jesus, when God meets us where we're at, you have to know this. He is going to confront every kingdom. He will confront every kingdom, whether it's a larger social kingdom or whether it's your personal, my personal kingdom. He will confront it. He will say, you've been acting as if you're Lord of your life, but the true Lord is here. And you have this opportunity. I have not come to crush you. I have not come to condemn you or to destroy you. I have come to save you, to rescue you from yourself. Will you receive that? And here's the beauty of it. That's why the angel can say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The same glory that reveals God is not safe because he's so great and so powerful to sinners like us. He's not safe, but that same glory reveals he is good. He loves you. He does know you by name. You've been marginalized, pushed aside, where people feel like you don't count, but all the while, the true Son of God, the true Lord over all, is saying, I know you by name. I've seen everything that you've experienced. And don't for a second think that it doesn't matter. It matters to me, God says. I meet you right there where you're at god enters our experience and he doesn't just come to say i empathize with you like i feel real bad that you've been marginalized and pushed to the outside he does this beautiful amazing thing where he says i'm going to come and meet you where you're at and enter your pain i'm going to enter your pain I could come to the shepherds and say, I'm the true Lord and Savior of the world, so come over to my palace, because that's where I'm going to be born. That's where a true king is born. Meet me there, fellas, and you'll see that I will make things right. But instead, God actually lowers himself and becomes like us in every way, including experiencing rejection. So shepherds, can you relate to this? You're going to find this new king in a feeding trough. You think a shepherd can relate to that? A lot more than a palace? I think so. Feeding trough? Gosh, that's where we live. That's where we're mucking stuff out all the time. You're going to be right there? And that's exactly what God is saying. I come into your life, 
and I'm going to meet you in your pain, in your sorrow, in your struggles. That's where this saving is going to begin. So we like to say this. God meets us where we're at. But he doesn't meet us there to leave us there. He meets us where we're at to take us to a better place, to include us then in his kingdom and what he's doing. Here's how it ends. These shepherds receive this good news. Could it really be? There's a God who's seen right through us. We're not worthy of anything, but he still loves us, and he calls us to his, to his love and his kingdom, and, and now we get to be included. And here's this great switch. These guys who never knew, if you needed the latest news, you would never ask a shepherd. They were always clueless. They were out in the fields. For the first time, the outsiders are now insiders. See, they have the insider knowledge. They have the information that almost nobody else has at this point. God has told us first, shepherds, that a Savior's been born, and we got to go. we got to go check this out. Now we are the insiders. We have information no one else has, but you're going to see them immediately. And this, is, this shows the difference between you and I trying to make our own kingdom and us receiving the kingdom of God where he is Lord of our lives. He makes us insiders so that we immediately reach out to outsiders. Immediately. I could easily see these shepherds saying, finally, we got something over on you guys. Finally, we know something you don't. Now you can sit and stew about it for a little bit because we got it and you don't. And they could easily take all of that anger and angst and, and pain that they've experienced in their life and turn it right back and say, ha, gotcha. But instead, something has freed them to say, even the people who have marginalized us, who have re just kind of reduced us to nothing, we're going to go share this with them. And I'm pretty sure a lot of them won't believe us. Because we can't even go into a courtroom and have, and have people believe us. Hasn't, isn't this reversal great? God chooses the people who are least likely to be known as witnesses to be his witnesses. He takes people that the world would give no account to and say, you're on the front line, fellas. You got it first. I'm entrusting this to you. Go and share this good news. The outsiders are the first to go out. And the reason that they can do this is because they are done with they no longer have to worry about trying to gain status in this world. They could come to God and say, God, if you're true, if you're real, then you've got to flip this order. You've got to put us on top for a while because we've been on the bottom for a long time. But instead they say, oh, now I see. That's a game I don't even have to play. I don't have to worry about my status before other people. I don't have to worry and try to live off of the admiration and acceptance and approval of people. Don't get me wrong, that's all good stuff. I mean, we love it when we get affirmed, that's fantastic. But if, you don't, if you're living on that, you're gonna die by it. But if you're living first, your first love is, there's a God who knows me, loves me, cares, meets me where I'm at, that's the love that I'm carrying out into the world. So that even if they reject me, you can't touch this love. You cannot touch this love. It's a beautiful expression how God flips everything around and immediately they say, we gotta go tell people. Now. I know a lot of people struggle with this because we read these stories, and even as we read it again, you might have been putting yourself in a story and say, if I were to ask, you know, how many of you would want to be there to have an angel, an angel from God, supernaturally show up and tell you this good news? And I'm going to guess a fair number of us would say, you know, I think that'd be pretty cool. I think I would like to do that. In fact, we can take that even further and say, yeah, how come? God doesn't do that for me. I mean, he did it for shepherds. Why not for me? And the, the thing about this text is this truth. The shepherds get an angel to receive that good news. Most of us get shepherds. Most of us are going to hear the good news, not from angels, but from shepherds. And that's a struggle for a lot of people because they're like, no, I want God to, to kind of wow me here. I'll believe if God will give me that angelic experience, if, if I can have that. But instead, God has sent a bunch of lowly, no-name, kind of unimportant shepherds. And they are telling you and me the truth. It's good news. The king has broken in. You can be a part of his kingdom. You've got to surrender. Give up your kingdom for his. And you're like, you're just a shepherd. I, I want to hear from God. Most of us hear it from shepherds, not angels. We want that. So if we were there, I'm pretty sure we would say to the shepherds, look, I know you're telling me this. I want to hear from God. So if you just tell me where in the field 
that you, this happened to you? Like, give, show, I'm going to X marks the spot where the angel showed up because maybe we could build a little prayer chapel. Wouldn't that be great? This is in the, the very spot where the angels told the shepherds, and there's a good chance if you come to this prayer chapel, you're going to have an angelic visitation, and the angel is going to speak to you. And maybe we can go further with this with the shepherds. What, what time did this happen, shepherds? Well, it came upon a midnight clear. It was midnight, right? Okay, I don't know. It, it's late. They, tell us the exact time because I can write a book. And then I can say, prayer at this time will get you an angelic visitation if you just pray at the right time, if you're in the right spot. And we try to organize all these things and we think what we're really trying to do is reduce God to a formula and say, God, I can control you. If I can get all of the factors just right, all that really does is say, it's still my kingdom. And I get God to do what I want him to do. But instead, God says, no, it's the same good news. It's powerful. It will change your life. Can you hear it from a shepherd? Because our pride will say, they are so flawed. You, you, got, a, you got a guy up here. He can, this guy can't preach. I know Cliff. I've been on the basketball court with him. If you knew him like that, you wouldn't be up here listening. You know what? The messenger is always going to be flawed. Always. God will speak to you. I'm going to tell you this far. God is speaking to you in your life, not just here this morning. He is speaking to you through a flawed vessel. And part of your pride is saying, I can't receive that or hear it because the messenger is flawed. God always sends flawed messengers. There are no other kind except for Christ himself. But he chooses flawed people to say, listen to them. Hear them and you hear me. I'm using them to spread this good news. And when that happens, we stop worrying about how God will speak. Because don't get me wrong, I believe God still speaks through dreams. I believe God still speaks through visions, through angelic visitations. I think God does supernatural stuff all the time, but the majority of the way in which God has moved his kingdom forward is by normal human beings sharing the good news. And if you get stuck on the messenger, it's just your pride saying, I don't want to give up my kingdom. But if you receive it, here's the closing. The beautiful thing happens is when God uses ordinary people, actually greater work is done. This is one of the things Jesus said to his disciples. You're going to do greater things than me. Not that they become greater than him, but because he says, I'm going to send out so many messengers with the truth. It's going to be powerful. There's a, there's a city in Illinois, and this was some years back, back in the 1980s. It's, it's spelled differently than ours. Wakanda, Illinois. And they had, uh, it was a small town like ours, real similar to ours, actually. They had two water towers like we do. And they had, a, they had kind of this tradition. For over 40 years, every Christmas season, on these two water towers, they would put lights, but not just any kind of lights randomly. They would make them into two huge crosses. Because they said, hey, the reason for the season, we're celebrating the, the birth of Christ, and the birth of Christ is always connected to his death. We're going to... We're going to re remember this, but this was a city that did this. And in 1989, uh, American Atheists Incorporated brought a lawsuit. And they said, no, you can't do that. That's government property. You, you can't have the government promoting one particular religion. And, of course, the town was really kind of disappointed. And they thought, well, we're not going to let outsiders tell us what to do. But they had already seen that these same lawsuits had been won in other small towns, and they could not afford to lose. And so they said, we've got to take these down. And so they did. After 40 years, they, didn't put, they took the lights down. No more lights this year on our water towers. And the city workers who brought the, those lights down are like, this is just, I, I don't feel good about this, but we have to do this. You know what I'm going to do? One of the city workers said, I'm going to, at home, in my home, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to make a, a cross out of lights. I'm going to put it in our, my living room window. And they had about four or five other city workers, and they're like, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that too. Starts off with five guys who have just crosses and lights in their windows. People in a small town are driving around. They see these lights. And say, That's a great idea. Next thing you know, more people are putting these same cross lights into their, into their own personal um, living room windows until there are hundreds of people in this town. And somebody noted, there's more light this way than we used to have with the big flashy way. That's exactly what God is doing. Do you, do you see that in your life? It's the common stuff. It's the, it's the stuff that we would take for granted. It's, it's shepherds that we give no account to. Do, 
if you listen, if I listen, that's the God of the universe who has come because of his great love for us and spared no expense in reaching down to us and coming into our, the dirt and grime of our existence say, I'm going to meet you there because I got something way better for you in my kingdom. That's the message that we proclaim. Again, but God is at work in a fresh way, in a new way today. Let's pray. We give thanks, Lord, um, that you are good, that your love, God, when your glory comes, it's scary at first, but your love is so quick to show us that if you wanted to be rid of us, we'd already be gone, gone with. And here instead, we see that your grace has given us life that we don't deserve. And now, God, to have your Son revealed, we pray that our hearts fight against and lay down this um, pride that would otherwise keep us from receiving you. That's what we want this season, God. We want you. We know that you have gifts to give us, but we want you above all else. So help us to surrender our kingdoms now, to receive humbly, and then to go right back out, God, and to share this message. And though our hearts will say, well, people won't believe me, people won't understand, people will discount me, God, your love can still compel us to go with joy. And then we have a joy that the world can't take away. And so we pray that you work this among us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So worship God. Um, we'll have this closing song. It's a great song to worship God with. If right now, however, you feel like there's an area of your life you want some prayer, we're going to be available at these doors. So while we sing, just go ahead and, and come on out while people are singing. You won't disturb anybody. While everybody's singing, come on out, meet with us. We would love to pray with you about any need you have. So let's stand. Let's worship God today. And there were shepherds living out in their fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I will bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger.